part of the scripture, which will be later in the message, is um, about being in a desert and the lack of water. So we'll, we'll mention that. But um, we're, we're focusing on soul keeping. So if you've been here for three weeks, you know that this is a series that we're on with uh, John Ortberg's book, a, w a wonderful minister out in California who's written a lot of books, but this one kind of hits our, us right between the eyes. I want to start off with, um, how many have heard of this little company called Google before? And so the statement says that Google is the most creative company around and one of the most fun to work with. So most creative and most fun to be an employee. What an, um, asserting that makes all of us employees jealous that we could work there. Google is not just a powerful, powerful search engine. How many companies do you know now have become verbs? Just Google it, is what we say. But it's developed such products as how many are on Gmail? Anybody out there on Gmail? I am. How many use Google Maps? I prefer that over the others, yeah. And a list of other things that Google is doing right now. Google's well known also for its work environment. Uh, it provides pool tables, bowling alleys, free food, gym memberships to all the members. In fact, it even employs a CHO, Chief Happiness Officer whose sole job is to keep employees happy and maintain productivity, it says. CHO. Laszlo Bach is Google's vice, um, senior vice president of, of people operations. And he says he's responsible for attracting, developing, retaining, and delighting Googlers in his job description. In his book, Work Rules, exclamation mark, Bach offers a ton of advice helping it others uh, live and lead. He says, take away manager's power over employees. Learn from your very best employees and your worst. Pay unfairly. It's only fair. Only hire people who are smarter than you are, no matter how long it takes to find them. He says, he sums it up, if you're comfortable with the amount of freedom you've given your employees, you haven't gone far enough. This freedom thing is, is uh, what Google is well known for, the freedom to think way beyond the lines and the borders and enshrined, enshrined in the management ethos of Google is this concept of the 20% rule. No, this is not a stewardship sermon. It's soul keeping. But the founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, highlighted this idea, this 20% rule, and I quote, we encourage our employees, in addition to their regular projects, to spend 20% of their time working on what they think will benefit Google most. 20% of their time. This empowers them to be more creative and innovative. Many of our significant advances have happened in this manner. 20% on creativity, what they think will benefit Google most. Now this morning, we've talked about the first week, what is the soul? Then we talked about the struggles of the soul. And today we're talking about what the soul needs. Perhaps we should Google our soul and creatively consider what will benefit our soul the most. Dallas Willard, name you've heard before, it's uh, John Ortberg's spiritual mentor who died a few years ago out in California. He makes a profound statement. It's on your cheat sheet. You've got sermon notes in here somewhere right there on the top. The main thing you will give to God is the person you become. You and nobody else are responsible for the well-being of your soul. You know, we live in a world that teaches us anything but that. You are probably more concerned and taught this in our culture to be more concerned about the condition of your car 
or the condition of your career or the condition of your portfolio than you are the condition of your soul. Maybe because a dent in a soul is more easily concealed than a dent in your car. Or maybe because a dent in your soul is harder to fix than a dent in your car. But the keeper of your soul is responsible for its dents. And you are the keeper of your soul. In Matthew 10, Jesus says a a very disturbing statement. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Do you know that phrase, do not be afraid, or sometimes it's translated fear not, is used 365 times in the Bible. But here, Jesus is saying, be afraid of something. What's it you're supposed to be afraid of? Something so important, so everlasting, so beneficial to the well-being of your soul that we better be afraid if we don't acknowledge just how essential it is. Be afraid, Jesus says. The body eventually wears out and the soul, though, lasts forever. We don't like to think about this either. That at some point, the Bible teaches one day we'll stand before God who is the judge of our eternal destiny. And if you live your life in deliberate violation of his will and his ways, your soul will eventually be destroyed by being completely separated from God. Look in your sermon notes again because in the next statement at the heart of Jesus' teaching are these truths. Make room in your life to care for your soul. Protect it, guard it, keep it. Only one person can keep the soul, and that one person is you. So back to Google. What if you used the 20% rule in what you think would benefit your soul? What would you do each day to be more creative in keeping and benefiting your soul? How much time would you set aside for the soul purpose? Ortberg says the solution is quite simple, although it's also very hard to do. Last thing in your notes here. And we're going to talk about these in the weekly small groups that will study this topic this week because there's a lot packed in here. But Ortberg offers, slow down, look up, lean in, listen to God, be responsible for faithfully keeping your soul, and it's an all-day, everyday deal. You know, Paul says this same kind of thing in all of his letters at some point. He'll say, think on these things, or do this and not do that. He's talking about doing something in your life to keep your soul. But he sums it up best in what I think is probably the most often quoted, though rarely followed maxim, Proverb, axiom, Galatians 6, 7. You reap what you sow. Don't have to be a person of faith to have known that one. Quite well known. Ortberg calls this maxim the reality 101. It's otherwise known as the law of consequences. And the trouble is, most people 
and probably most of us sitting here, we don't think it applies to us. It applies to the people on the pew, on the chair, in the next room, your neighbor. It doesn't apply to us. We have some special dispensation, right? That it doesn't apply to us. It only happens to the other person, this law of consequences. The person who thinks like this, let me give you some examples. I can spend all I want without getting into debt. It's because they don't believe in the law of consequences. I can lie without getting caught. I can let my temper fly without damaging my relational life. I can have a bad attitude at work and get away with it. I can avoid disciplining my children without their getting spoiled. I can neglect the Bible and still know God. You see, our capacity to live in denial about the law of consequences, of getting by in life without giving the effort and creativity to our soul keeping is damaging to our soul. What our soul needs. It's the heading of the message. What our soul needs is to be in right relationship with God. A healthy relationship with God. To do everything we can each day to fulfill that desire. And so often we substitute other things in place of God, money, power, um, people, things, whatever. Scripture has a word for that. It's called idolatry. We will always take the most care of that which we value most deeply. These are all Ortberg's words. And we talk about them during the week, trying to flesh out what's that mean in your life? Jesus described this in another story, an interesting story, which you heard before. There's a wealthy farmer, and he's done quite well, had a bumper crop year, and he finally says to his own soul, soul, you've been working really hard. Why don't you take it easy? You know, eat, drink, be merry. His life became an upscale village filled with expensive homes. Until one night, God told him, you fool! This very night, your soul is required of you. And when Jesus says the man's soul will be required, that's really an interesting term, a word that he's chosen in this writing that comes from the business world. It's a term that would describe a loan that has been fallen due. Because our souls are on loan to us. One day God will review with us what our souls have become. That is what will matter from our lives. The psalm that I think of in this reflection of what our souls need is one of my favorites, Psalm 63. And so it's on the other page in your bulletin as well as to, up on the screen, listen to God's word to you. Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. And because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast. And my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. 
for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there are two things that David has given to us that I just want to highlight to close with. And the first thing is right there in verse 2. And it's what we'll call a sanctuary experience. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. You see, at first instance, we might gloss right over that. But David, he's achieved the, the, the ability to mentally recreate the place of his holy moments. To recollect the impact of the community of faith which he is a part of, to, to think of his, the church leaders, his mission trips, his youth group, his prayer time, his giving of causes like to the Presbyterian disaster assistance, to be a blessing to other people. All of this is what is happening in the sanctuary experience. Think back on the Psalms that you know, most of which David has written, and there seems to be this consistent thread of a reference to a sanctuary. David has made a sanctuary as a regular experience in his life in order to benefit his soul. And consistently, the two themes that are pounded into us when we go to the sanctuary are the themes of God's power and God's glory. Two indispensable themes that our souls need to be reminded of every day sanctuary experience. And secondly, we'll call this need of our soul from David's perspective a bedroom experience. Sanctuary experience, a bedroom experience. You can call it quiet time. You can call it one-on-one. -on -one, you can call it devotion. You can call it meditation. But in verses 5 and 6, it says, my soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. It reminds me of that verse um, 35 in, in Mark 1, where Jesus gets up very early in the morning while it's still dark, and he goes, and, goes out of the house, finds a solitary place, and there he prays. Now, he went to bed late. He had a busy night. But that's a priority in his life. To have one-on-one -on -one time with God the Father. That's what he means by this bedtime experience. It, it reminds me uh, that, that I have made it a, a practice in my life to get up in the morning with my soulmate... And most mornings we do a devotion together. We actually do a couple with our coffee. And if we miss that, I feel like there's something missing all that day. And his own words in verse 7, David allows his soul to be filled with memories that remind him, it says, for you, God, are my help. To think back on all the times that God has pulled him through. That God has been there when he needed him. And to know that that trust in God. The same thing we talked about, taught confirmation this morning. How do you know and trust God? Fifteen-year-olds. I said, go ask some of your parents to help answer that question. How do you know and trust God? Because of sanctuary experiences and because of bedtime experiences here. Reminding yourself the power and the glory of God and that God, you are my help. Probably at that time he's written some psalms like Psalm 23, restoring my soul. That's what it says. So two things that David offers us in the psalm, the sanctuary and bedroom experience. But remember, our thirst for God is the basic need of our soul to be in right relationship with God, to have a healthy relationship with God. That's a need that you and I share. The main thing you will give to God is the person you become. 
you and nobody else are responsible for the well-being of your soul. Google that, and let's see how your soul will benefit this week. Let's pray. Almighty God, we bow our heads out of reverence for you because you are the one who calls us to be in relationship with you. You are the one our soul needs. Help us this week to be inspired, to be creative, to think of what would be best to benefit our soul. All for your sake we pray. Amen.